Chapter 21, Happenings in the Night For some time we smoked in silence, a silent night, one of those listening nights when the world seems bathed in a quiet beauty. Well, I admitted a bit enviously, I'd like to have my bush senses developed as yours are, must come in handy at times, in the country away north, where they say the blacks are still bad, it could save a man's life, too. Of course, much more than that, though, for a man who trains his senses is constantly seeing more, hearing more, knowing more, far more. How is that? Because it is by his senses that a man knows things. Of course, otherwise he would be a real animal. Because, again, the senses interact, compare it, in a way, to the compound interest the teachers tried to hammer into us at school. If you strive to cultivate your hearing, then your eyes come into play. Two, they try to see farther, to see what you are hearing. Mind or instinct or experience gets busy, too trying to build up a mind picture to show you what you are seeing and hearing. Each sense strives to help the other. Thus, each sense becomes sharper and grows, too, until suddenly, but only after a long time of constant effort, you begin to know things. He's leading me into deep waters again, I thought uneasily. What animal has the keenest sight, I asked. Man, easily, he sees farther much more distinctly, and of course, in incomparably greater detail than any other animal. I've proved it many a time, so far as Australian animals are concerned, anyway. This surprised me, for until that afternoon... I'd believed that animals could see as well, if not better than men. You believe man to be an animal or not. So far as the body machinery is concerned, though fortunately he does not walk on all fours, but his power of using brain and mind and hands and tongue makes him something very different so different that, of course, there can be no comparison. What is man, then? I don't know, he replied dreamily. You must seek that answer out among the stars. Hmm, I murmured. The stars away up there seemed suddenly so very, very far away. Like the ages of time behind us. But the ages of time had been here. We could see it for ourselves in the old buried river beds, and we could see the stars, too, the past and the present. If there was any past and present, was the answer away out there or right here? Vaguely uneasy at these strange thoughts, I broke the spell, so man can see best of all. Of the animals, yes, but the eagle beats us in one way. So does the owl at night, which is when night-prowling animals can see better than us also. Ah, night sight. Yes, can night sight be developed too? Yes, have you trained your sight by night also? Yes, not too successfully, but I can see far better now at night than when I was a boy. Curiously again, I glanced at him. He had put aside the pipe and just lay there gazing up at the heavens where his thoughts seemed to be wandering. What secrets of nature did this strange man know? As if in answer, he said quietly, There is a wallaby being hunted for its life by dingoes away down the ravine. It is racing up this way. Do you hear it? Deep silence told my straining ears no. Listen, then. 
A moment later, there came the sharp tinkle of a falling stone, bouncing on bare rock down along the gully bottom, a stone dislodged by frantic paws. Soon I heard thud, 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 thud in urgent haste. I sat up as the wallaby came swiftly, body, body sharply outlined by starlight across on the gully ridge, a speeding ghost along the silvered skyline. He was going all out as he bounded past and vanished over the slope. And now followed the wild dogs, a pair, one behind the other, in silent, merciless pursuit, their lean bodies flecked by starlight as they too vanished. I settled down on the blanket again, amazed. What marvelous hearing you must have! How far down the gully were they before you heard them? Some little distance. I heard them while we were talking, waited a while to make sure they were coming this way. Well, I declared, I just would not have believed it had I not been here. I can hardly believe it now. Somehow I felt I'd said the right thing and inquired, Have you developed your sense of smell as keenly as hearing? Nothing like it. It is far more difficult to wake up our ancestors let it go to sleep for too long. Once <clears throat> the civilized man no longer needed to fear tigers sniffing around for a meal, he thankfully gave his sense of smell away, as it were. I never thought of that, I grinned. No doubt a keen sense of smell would be mighty handy if a hungry lion came prowling about, I say, it's lucky we've got no man-eating lions and tigers in Australia. We wouldn't be camping here like this if there were, he replied grimly. Nor would thousands of others who will enjoy a peaceful night's sleep under the stars tonight. About the only chance a man, of a man being eaten tonight in Australia is if someone foolishly camps too close to the bank of a crocodile-infested river. Hmm, a grim awakening. Still, you must travel a long way to those rivers, and the very few white men there would know the danger. So, I still cannot see the benefit to a civilized man in developing such an acute sense of smell. Your friend, Long Stuart, wishes he had it. Why, I asked in surprise, because then he would not sleep at times with death adders. In the deathly silence I stared, bewildered. He chuckled up at the stars, surprised you, sort of took my breath away. What's the joke? No joke at all, at least not to your friend Stuart. Fumbling with the pipe, Uneasily, I glanced at him, not knowing what to say or think. Complacently, he blew a smoke ring up to encircle a star. Taking his own time, presently he said, Has Stuart never told you, around that council fire of yours, of his affinity for the death adder? No, well, it is fact. After a pause, he said quietly, you don't believe me. Well, er, it is fact. The death adder seeks Stuart, seeks to camp with him, to coil up in his very own blanket. I don't know the cause, but I do know of similar instances. Anyway, when traveling in death adder country, Stuart becomes very uneasy towards sunset. He must reach water, of course, but must get to camp in ample time to scout around and find a clear spot to camp, clear of all possible chance of a death adder. You know how they lie about in that sleepy way of theirs. Have you ever awakened in the morning to find you had spread your blanket on a death adder? No, 
Stuart has, and the evening before he has examined every inch of that ground, and away beyond it, before he spread his blankets. Too puzzled to say anything, I smoked a while in silence. When next he spoke, I listened most uneasily. You still do not believe me. You believe that if what I said was true, then Stuart would surely have brought it up as an interesting topic for the council fire. Some time when you have all been yarning about snakes, for instance. He had read my thoughts, which now became too muddled to reply. Oh, well, he said, and I could swear his voice had a grin. In it, Stuart may tell you all about it some time, and he may not. You see, he may not be at all happy about this attraction of the death adder to him, but come now, admit that in the case of a civilized man like Stuart, he would be glad, indeed, of a sense of smell that would detect a death adder near his camp. Too right, I admitted. I agree with you there. These things are strange to me. I was a bit puzzled, that's all. There are many strange things in life, he said quietly, but they are only strange because we do not understand them. A speck of mica was glittering like a diamond in the granite rock. I do not understand even that, I thought. It is but a flake of mica reflecting light from a starbeam. Now, I think of it, that star beam must have traveled millions of miles. This cove must be making me think things. Everything has a smell, he was saying lazily. Call it a scent, if you like, from a flower to a rock. Did you ever imagine that rocks possess a smell? Of course you never have. Well, prove it for yourself. Every time you, your your pick breaks a different kind of rock. Smell it. Sooner or later, you'll be surprised. Rocks have their own feel, too. If you would, only develop another sense, the sense of touch. Some feel rough, others smooth, oily, cold, warm, dry, moist, heavy, light, greasy. You've felt a slippery back, and surely soap stone and that distinctive feel of a powdered manganese seam, that feel, too, of molly bitonite. Just wait until you feel your fingers fondling your first nugget of gold. Ah, I see response there. And he was not even looking at me. Then again, he went on, different rocks possess another power of smell, as surely you know. Heat iron pyrites, and what do you smell? Sulfur, I said wonderingly. Of course, heat arsenical pyrites. But take care you are not poisoned by arsenical fumes, and so on. Do you see now that even rocks have their smell? Yes, I just hadn't thought about it. You asked me of what real use is this more or less well-developed sense of smell of mine. Well, for one thing, it is great company. If I were lying alone here in this bush tonight and a porcupine came creeping along, I would know, always providing some vagrant air current came drifting over him towards me, you could not hear him, could not see him, but I would know he was out there, very earnestly engaged in his porcupiney business, sniffing, snout-rooting, a prickly business at times, too, at times, again, even a matter of life and death, and his life is quite as valuable to the pork as yours is to you. I could lie here quietly smoking, 
and follow his every movement out there in the dark. I'd know all he was doing, and they are very quaint little things, believe me, with quaint habits, and like getting their own way. They are dogged little brutes, quite bad-tempered when upset, too, and can be very nasty about it. You've never seen, I suppose, the antics of a really bad-tempered old man porcupine. You, of course, would never believe, because you don't know these things of quite old pork when quiet old pork when you meet him out in the daylight and lever him over with a stick. All he seeks to do is swiftly burrow himself out of your sight. If the ground is too hard, he sucks his underbody to the earth, spreads out his quills, and with a motionless tenacity, hopes for the best. But when he's out on the prowl at night, in his own little world, he's quite a different fellow. Thinks no end of himself, too. Which, after all, is only running true to form. If we all are of the animal kingdom. He paused, put down his pipe, cupped his head in his hands, and silently gazed up at those stars of his. Go on, I said eagerly. I'm talking too much. No, you're not. I'll bet you've never had a more interested listener. Go on, where you left the old porcupine out in the dark. Oh, well, of course, it would not be dark to him. The mystery of night is still the breath of life to him. He would be company to me. I would lie here, dreaming up at the sky, and yet be watching every movement of Porky's little game away out there in the grass for as long as the air currents told me, particularly if it were mating season, and then I would know, too, whether he were he or she, and I could lie here and watch every movement of his or her or their little game, and believe me, at times it is comical the path of true love does not always run smooth even for the spiny anteater. She may be suspicious of his intentions, not much interested anyway, which works him up into a perfect porcupiney fury in trying to impress upon her what a fine porcupine he really is. Of course, we are merely speaking of the animal kingdom. Yes, I answered somewhat hazily. Seems to me I recognize something about it. You'd be surprised, he replied, and I could almost swear to, to a fleeting smile. Well, this sense of smell often is great company before I turn in of nights. I can smell wild pig, a prowling old boar, savage bad-tempered old brutes. They are or sow and litter. Goodness knows how far away. Naturally, it depends on favorable atmospheric conditions and air current direction. You can understand that a man can smell a pig, of course. Oh yes, but I never dreamt you could smell it for any great distance. Distance only comes with development of the sense. Anyway, the smell of wild pig is surprisingly more distinctive and animally than that of gluttonous, overfed porkers in a piggery, and to me, anyway, much more cleanly. And can you tell what the pigs are doing to see them as you can the porcupine? Of course, and much farther away, naturally so, and more vividly than shy little old pork, whose ways are more difficult to understand. I've seen, that is by smell, some savage fights between two wild boars that have met away out there in the night. Generally, they'll just pass one another warily, I can easily imagine, probably, with a contemptuous grunt, 
but if somewhere handy there happens to be a fine young sow in contemplative mood, well, then it is a different greeting altogether. Neither boar will give way. Little eyes gleam green. They glare piggish hate at each other. Root the earth with those murderous tusks, grunt and squeal in primitive fury, and shake their ugly heads until they're fairly slathering at the snout. That mane along the back of their neck stands erect, fairly bristling with rage. Then they lower their heads and charge, and it will be a savage all in fight, believe me. I can see all this because at times of mating and fight the animal smell increases with a hot intensity. And then, of course, in the big scrubs, I've been hidden and watched them fight in daylight many a time. I can see such a fight just as plainly at, at night when lying in camp by sense of smell alone. I thought I knew a fair bit about the bush, I said wonderingly, but I never dreamt of these things. It helps let me know lots of things, he said dreamily. For instance, that at this moment there is a wild cat spying down upon us from a cleft in this very rock wall, below which we are camping, and its sharp little nose is sniffing our smell, and the smell of the fire. It is actively curious, but fearful too. We would feel just the same at sight and smell of something big and frightening which we did not understand. However, when I'm alone in the bush, especially at night, particularly if in jungle country, this sense of smell is great company, and it tells me of inquisitive company nearby in the jungle darkness, which I may not even see or hear. It even tells me when the snakes are making love. What? Did you not know that snakes make love? It seemed in the firelight there was almost a smile at the corners of his mouth. I've never heard of it, I replied doubtfully. Well, they do, sometimes, silently, intensely, mostly, though, with surprising noises, swift movement, generally, too, with quite a lot of showing off. I've never heard anything at all about it. I said wonderingly, and so you really can smell snakes. Yes, of course, especially during the mating season. That's how they advertise their presence to one another. At least some kinds do, I'm certain, for snakes have to meet one another, just as we do. But at any season, should a crawler be near the camp, I know he's there, especially in the big scrubs. There, in jungle country, after a hot day, over the outside forest, the jungle at night is often humid from the decayed vegetation and moisture so often dropping from the leaves above. At such times I can smell a snake quite a distance away. There doesn't seem any air in the deathly quietness deep in there, but of course there is and it's always moving, though you can seldom feel it among all those tree trunks. And this carries smell very distinctly of animal, of bird, of a scented bark, but particularly of snake. To me, anyway, he paused to fill the pipe. What does snake smell like? I asked curiously. Not pleasant. A man would dislike it if he were foolish enough to be prejudiced. It's a mixture of animal and stale, earthy smell. You could nearly say it was beastly, but it is distinctive snake, all right. Immediately you smell it, you can see the crawler. In your mind's eye, of course, but there's no mistaking it. Can you tell the different snakes? I asked curiously. A number of them now, but it took me quite a time. How do you mean? Well, for some years, every time I saw a snake, 
and later, as I developed and could smell the crawler, when he was out of sight, I'd walk to him and smell him thoroughly. A carpet snake, for instance. Seeing him, I'd know him, of course, by smelling him and registering his smell. Then eventually, a developed sense of smell would tell me what he was without me seeing him. Same with the black snake, the brown, too. I very soon learnt to smell them in the mating season, naturally. As I said, the smell strongest then. Good heavens, but aren't snakes particularly vicious at that time? Of course, and you'd go out and smell such a snake. Yes, stone the crows how. Pick him up with a tight grip at the back of the neck. Grip the butt of the jaws. Haven't you ever done it? He asked half scornfully. It's simple, then hold him up to my neck. He'd wind himself, wind himself round my neck and nostrils, and I'd take all the smell. I wanted. He'd be quite vicious, of course, and the matter he got, the more he'd smell. He'd smell like a pole cat, as the saying is. Good heavens, I said, and just gazed at him. There seemed almost a sneer in his faint smile. To find out things, to learn things, you've got to do things, he murmured, and do them thoroughly. I lay back, silently promising myself I'd never learn the smell of snake, not as he knew it anyway. It must be a handy gift to, to develop, I ventured at last somewhat lamely. You could smell a snake around camp and go out and belt the daylights out of him before he came dangerously near. Why should I, he answered quietly. I never interfere with them, and they never interfere with me. I've had them crawl over my chest in the bunk at night, lots of times. Did not move while they crawled on and away. The same experience was soon to be mine. I didn't move either because I was scared stiff. Besides, he went on, what would be the sense of learning to know the presence of things if you were going to chase them away just when they would be company and of interest too? Hmm, what kind of snake can you smell the farthest distance away? That is difficult. It depends entirely on the season, whether in scrub or forest, and conditions of atmosphere and, of course, whether a man is in the mood. But, for instance, I can smell a python on a still, warmish day quite a distance if he is sleeping off a meal with a young wallaby inside him. Yes, I said dubiously. I suppose they'd hum a bit more then. Anyway, where on earth is the interest, let alone company of a mob of snakes around a camp at night? Have you ever camped in the big scrubs alone? No. Well, he said grimly, if ever you do, then you'll know what loneliness really feels like, and you can feel that loneliness. Then don't let the pitch blackness and the creeping silence and that drip, drip, drip of water drops from the leaves get on your nerves. Or the whisperings going on among those millions of tree trunks. Often I've been near certain that trees whisper among themselves. Anyway, that sense of smell can be very matty when it lets you know some quaint thing of the scrubs is coming to keep you company. However, so far as snakes are concerned, in some portion of a jungle, here and there, the place will suddenly become alive with them maybe only in that one particular little area. I was to find this to be quite true, too, if it happens to be the mating season, and your camp is pitched right there, then, without that sense of smell, look at all the lively things you miss. At night time, I'd smell them coming swiftly, slithering around from all over the place, and those urgent hissings, and other queer little sounds I can hardly explain. 
have shown me lots that was going on, kept me company for hours on end. The swift meetings, the rising up of the agitated heads on long quivering necks, the swang and parrying, those black tongues flickering in and out fast as lightning. Then in places those demon fights with two snakes locked together until one kills the other. Elsewhere the rising and swaying until the glistening necks glide across one another as in a caress. Then all around there is a perfect orgy of love wrestling. I've had them writhe right into the very tent despite the light of the hurricane lamp. They simply know nothing but one another, and the mad urge. I can assure you I've never been lonely on such nights, such an orgy a man sees seldom, of course, and only if he happens to have camped in such a spot during the very nights that this particular snake life is going on. Well, it is this developed sense of smell that has both brought me company and shown me things on such nights, on many and many a lonely night. For although I actually miss nearly all of such interesting happenings, still I see quite a lot indeed, which left me too amazed to reply. It is an uneasy feeling to be listening to something you vaguely realize must be true, yet cannot understand, something like being awake in a nightmare but I slept as snugly as a bug in a rug. Chapter 22 The Town That Moffat Built Cold dawn came to the lively crackling of a fire. Billy's boiled. With sleepy rebellion, I slung off the blanket at the second call and sat up. We slept in our clothes, of course, much warmer that way. Besides dodging the necessity of carrying another blanket, that fire hummed nice and warm. The billy was steaming and I was jolly hungry. Rippling fire lifted the wild peaks to eastward up out of a sleeping world. Flaming fingers quivered heavenward towards a lightening sky. Protestingly, a bird attempted a sleepy squawk here and there. By the time we'd wolfed a simple breakfast and slung on the swags, a crimson sky was warming the dark face of the earth, and we stepped on into a noisily growing aviary as another day was born. Once over the divide, we dropped down into country that reminded me of some old picture of Dante's Inferno, my mate trudging on hour after hour without a word, barely a grunt, even when we boiled the midday billy, and morose that evening, yet again he had not stopped to try one dish of dirt all day even though trudging over country, fairly shouting for the prospector's pick, and my mind was warm with dreams of stumbling upon a fortune in ten, a new great northern, a Vulcan, a Lee Moon, a king of the ranges. I even dreamt of sinking up the pick into a golden gully, but sundown came softly, and he had not tried one dish. It was a silent camp. I left him to his thoughts, whatever they were, and took my disappointment to the land of sleep, and dreamt of finding another Palmer, and a kiss from Palmer Kate. Such a kiss used to cost the old gold diggers an ounce of gold, a golden kiss indeed, such a reward would have sent me clean broke at present, but it was a golden dream. Next day, deep among arid-looking hills, sounded the rumbling of explosives. 
soon here and there on rocky hillsides we saw the gray dump of a shaft or the black of a tunnel mouth and toiling men burnt nearly black by the sun. Irvine Bank made itself heard well before we saw it, a murmur growing into the roar of forty head of stampers. As we strolled along the deep-trodden mule track, I could not help thinking of my mate, seeing things by hearing, for it was easy now to visualize this lively mining township, the roar of the batteries now fading away to roar again as the big iron stampers crushed down on their song, and their song was carried along the gullies by the breeze, dull thunder of heavy explosive charges, then sharp and clear through a break in the hills, the clang of steel upon steel, sharp echo of an axe, throaty roar of a boiler letting off steam, then a slowly drifting cloud of dust and smoke, showing where the smelters were on Gibbs Creek, machinery transported to this wilderness and erected by the foresight and indomitable will of one John Moffat, from the rock-grit hills around the township, pack mules laden with ore from outlying mines were cautiously snaking their way round precipitous tracks, warily working their way down to the dusty road and the battery. No chance of wheel traffic up in, up in them that hills. Even a mountain goat would need to be an athlete to climb some of them, and now a lazily rising cloud of dust showed where pack mules and horse teams, wagons, and loaded buckboards met to roll on towards the scattered township, its iron roofs glinting under sunlight among the scrubby hills and gullies. The Vulcan the jungle man pointed, and I gazed across at the big mine, up there on its hillside, pride of Moffat, of all Irvine Bank, the Vulcan already developed into the biggest, deepest, and richest tin mine in all North Queensland. High up, stretching right down to the creek by the battery, were aerial ropeways down which suspended trucks laden with Vulcan ore were dizzily swishing down to the battery. The stacks at the nearby smelters were belching smoke, and lovely sight in this hot, often thirsty area. The sunlit water of a large dam made a sanctuary for wild ducks by John Moffat. Overlooking the dam was a home that caught the eye immediately. In a little oasis of greenery, Moffat built it, said my mate. He built the dam, too. Without it, both life and work would be impossible for a township here. Facing the precious dam way was a long, dusty street. It was really a road lined with shops and hotels, very hot-looking. Citizens on horse or foot or in carts, or going quietly about their business along this street. That town is all made of tin, said the jungle man. Just tin, there is nothing else. Just tin and rock, sweat and heat and mules and horses, and the energy of men, gathered together and cemented into a busy town by the brains, foresight, and energy of one man. Moffat, you mean, of course snaking out from gully after gully among the, that sea of hills, appeared laden teams constantly plodding down to the township and battery, while now the road from Stannery Hills was a dust cloud under plodding teams, a busy scene and of warm interest to me. There must be hundreds of shows back in those hills, I exclaimed. There are 
I wouldn't venture to guess how many hundreds, all made possible to work because of Moffat and his battery, and now the smelters, otherwise only the very richest of the loads could have been worked, even then only for a short life, who found the Vulcan. No one knows one of the early prospectors who abandoned it because he could not find rich surface ore. With no battery, let alone a smelter's, and with an impossible transport problem, none but the richest of surface ores was payable, yet the Vulcan is the richest tin mine, even richer than the Great Northern and wild Irishmen in Herberton. The load was really opened up by a party of Italian woodcutters years later. They went broke on their first crushing but sold the show to the Vulcan Tin Mining Company, Moffat's Crowd. Irvine Bank was originally found by Gibbs and Donahue's party. Seemingly, two parties rode into this country at about the same time. Thompson, Green, Pollard, McDonald, and Eels were them, were with them about two years after Jack and Newell's party found Herberton. Gibbs' party found the Southern. You see it away up there, overlooking the creek. Quickly then, the adventurer, Comet, Tornado, Star of the South, Agnes, Valletta, Forlorn, Hope, Perseverance, and many other shows were found, still are being found today. The old-timers, though, had a lot of trouble with the blacks, not so many years ago either. A number of prospectors have been speared among the hills between here and Herberton. The early diggers here, as on all the early fields, and on the Russell too, down on the coast, always had to work with a revolver on their belt. However, Jim Bradshaw and other early arrivals following the tracks of Gibbs soon found other good shows. This place in the wild hills soon became known as Gibbs Camp. It was not until Moffat came with the idea of transport of that fine big storage dam for water and a battery on the spot to crush the ore that Irvine Bank was really put on the map. Why was the name changed to Irvine Bank? Because Moffat was born in Irvine Bank, Scotland. The people would much rather it had been called Moffat's Hills because he really made the place. They almost worship him there. Lengthening rays of the western sunset were lighting up the little houses clustered to the hills. Something in his voice made me glance at his sun-tanned face. I caught a fleeting glimpse of a most human smile. They do, he was saying softly, for I have seen youngsters on their knees at their bedside, ending up their prayer with, And God bless Mum and Dad, and please God bless John Moffat too. They must like him very much, I said, but his mood had vanished. Well, this is Irvine Bank, he said shortly. It is well established now. It is a little human ant bed among these grim old hills. Just fancy a railway actually coming creeping out here and I could have sworn there was a tinge of regret in his voice. Who built the railway? The government? No, Moffat, of course. He wasn't satisfied until he'd connected the Stannery Hills line to here. It is only a tramway, of course. The two-foot gauge line these energetic mining companies have built out north and south and west from the main Cairns Herberton Government Railway. From Boonmoo on the Cairns line, the Stannery Hills Company 
built the line out to Stannery Hills. John Moffat then carried it on to here. Last time I was at Irvine Bank, the first train arrived about three years ago, crowded with people from the Stannery Hills end. A funny little puffing Jenny crowded with waving, <clears throat> yelling human ants. You'd have thought the very hills had suddenly sprung alive and gone crazy, of course. It was a great day for Irvine Bank. John Moffat had 600 men <clears throat> on his payroll, a tremendous number for the small population of these isolated areas. I suppose Irvine Bank and the hills can muster about 3,000 people, counting children, of course. Well, from nearby townships and outlying camps, people just poured into Irvine Bank by horse, by buggy, and buckboard and camel and shank's pony. That was about the wildest week I've ever seen, and by far the gayest, and certainly it must have been the greatest collection of whiskers from the hills ever seen in North Queensland, and that is saying a lot, and as for dog fights, I'd see more in an hour than I'd see in a year otherwise, with, of course, the old abbo and his wife and pickaninnies enjoying themselves mightily on the outskirts. A wonderfully good-humored crowd, though. A week of meetings and greetings and dances and feastings, while the young girls saw more men than they'd ever dreamt existed. I'd have loved to have been there, I said longingly. I suppose so, he replied. But just remember that the old men of these hills are handy with a shotgun. Have you ever seen a shotgun marriage? I said with a grin. I have. So have I. I grinned again at Lightning Ridge. Well, let that be a lesson to you. Looking down the barrels of a double-barreled gun, he added grimly, is very different from looking into two smiling blue eyes. Oh, well, that tiny railway has meant a great deal to Irvine Bank. Practically ended isolation. Enabled hundreds of mines to be developed that it would never have paid to work otherwise. Made living conditions much easier. Solved a heartbreaking transport problem. It will be a godsend to the poor old horses and mules, I said. There must be thousands of them toiling among these thirsty-looking hills. Thousands and thousands, you've got no idea, not only here, but the teams plotting back to Herberton, the teams working between here and Stannery, let alone all the outside camps. Moffat has some beautiful teams of draught horses known throughout the north. I'll show you some lovely animals tomorrow, the very best in Queensland, I believe. Oh well, without the horse and mule and bullock, this country could never have been opened up. Come on, we'll go along down into town. It's pretty lively, it's booming. Livened up by the mere sight of the activity down below there, I stepped out beside my now taciturn mate and tried to keep the conversation going. Up till now, he'd hardly spoken a dozen words in the last two days. And how about Stannery Hills? Is it booming too? It is, always does, when there's a fair price for ten. And of course, it's got a great go on now that the tramways arrived there. Then again, your friends, the railway nav navvies, have been painting the place not only red, but every color of the rainbow. We may go along and see it while we are here. It's only 12 miles or so farther on. If we do, I'll introduce you to Peter the pig. Who on earth's he? Oh, and he almost smiled. That gentleman is the fattest, most cunning, most gluttonous pig in all Queensland. The only time he'll condescend to move is when someone calls him for a beer. He may have drunk himself to death by now, <clears throat> though it's some time since I've been in Stannery. 
he seems to be a bit of a character. He is nearly as well known as Townsville's boozing goat. You seem to have a fancy for animals. You put that disreputable old goat into Mick the Navvy's bed, but I'll bet you couldn't put Peter the Pig into any man's bed, not unless you rolled a barrel of beer in before him. Not feeling over-enthusiastic over meeting Peter the Pig, I held my peace until we strolled into town. By then, the afternoon shift was already knocking off, and groups of men were strolling along the deeply worn footpaths from mines to township to the little homes among the hills, the camps by hill and gully. Laughing voices, a bit of horseplay among the young fellows here and there. A full mile away, a figure high up on a rock, silhouetted in fire from the setting sun, stood yodeling in a voice that rang piercingly yet musically away. Out over hills and gullies and broken flats, my mate strode silently on those long, tireless legs of his, speaking now only when spoken to, and I was fairly bursting with questions. The long, straggling street was already growing lively, though, of course, no one was in a hurry. Folk strolling to shops, others for a knock-off beer at their favorite among the four hotels, horsemen calling greetings as they rolled by, teams making for their camps, a few women were shopping, my wandering eye spied nearly half a dozen shy-looking girls. Boyishly, I guessed the competition must be fierce. A handful of women in this ant-bed of hungry men. It was always so among these little mining townships, scattered far and wide amongst this sea of ranges, comparatively few people in the township by day. But at weekends... Especially, they came streaming out from among the hills until there seemed a little army of them. Especially so now where the line is coming through. Any township within reach of the navvies where the little railway lines had and still were creeping out from the main Cairns Herberton line to north and south and west, linking up mining camp after mining camp. Right there, from Saturday afternoon until Monday morning, day carried on throughout the night and today, with a liveliness that must have astounded the silence of the age-old hills. Of course, picture shows and radio and television and pastimes like that had not been invented in those days that were but yesterday. I was to see my very first motor car in Mariba, imported by the very progressive local doctor. I believe it was the first motor vehicle in all the hinterland. I had not even time to gape around me <clears throat> before my mate strolled out of Stillman's store, nodding, Come on, and we were trudging out of town towards the creek. Blast him, I thought unfairly too unsociable to buy a cooked meal even when we strike a town, though every shilling those days meant a shilling to me. Still, what a luxury a bought feed would have been. For a shilling, you could buy at any pub a meal that it took a buck navvy all his time to wolf through, and we might even have been served by a waitress. But never once in our little wanderings did my strange mate ever buy a meal at a township hotel. And this evening he custodly walked a mile away from the township, <clears throat> passing sheds even where we easily could have thrown down our swags for the night, would not even camp by Gibbs Creek, picked an out-of-the-way sheltered place that even cut out almost all sound, from the nearby township, though grudgingly I saw it was an ideal camp. There was the usual simple meal, quickly cooked as the shadows fell, but we were as hungry as hawks. Goodness knows how many miles we'd walked that day, 
over rough and trackless country. After the meal, he spread out his blanket, lit the pipe, then stretched out to gaze up at his everlasting stars. Surely he can leave them alone for one night, I thought grumpily. Coming for a stroll into town, I asked. No, you go if you want to. I've seen it all before. So there was I, trudging back to the bright lights, under that vastness of night amongst the black-shadowed hills. Those few dim lamps today would be thought a very dim show indeed, but as a little candle shines, <clears throat> like a good deed in a naughty world, as some poetic chap other than Mick Moore wrote, those lights were a symbol of the enterprise and dogged determination of man. And to me, a big town full of warm-hearted human beings and a wilderness of hills. Shy in my young days, I mooched quietly up to a group of men sitting, smoking, and yarning by Ledley's store, sat down and listened. There were other such groups along this dusty road, street just here. Slow-moving figures by the scattered busy pubs. From the nearest came a hum of voices, laughter drowned in a rollicking chorus of song. Probably there would be a few fights along the street before morning. The yarns were all <clears throat> of shows, of course, of percentages, of tonnage and crushings, of prospecting and the price of ten, of good and bad country and water, of the Vulcan and particularly of the Ten King John Moffat, of the doings of well-known prospectors, of returns from rich crushings that fairly took my breath away. Yet another group were yarning horsey talk, teamsters and packmen, these yarning of roads and tracks and loading and feed and camping places, of Barney Lazina with the largest team of mules on the road, a hundred and thirty of these sure-footed, sturdy slaves of man, of Donnie MacDonald, whose pride was his beautifully outfitted team that could carry almost unbelievable loads of the feats of Manny Borkiro, who seemed to be the gun packer of them all, and they yarned just as glowingly of horses and mules, as well known as the drivers, particular animals famed for their endurance and work. They drifted then on to yarns of daredevil drivers of Cobb and Co. Still in the limelight, though the coming of the iron horse was fast wiping out that colorful era, still another group were interested in the construction work of the mountain tramways, the problems and triumphs of a work that was a living romance in itself. I could have listened throughout the entire night. It was in a grumpy mood that I returned to my uninterested mate sound asleep. <clears throat>